four dead in Washington, D.C. from the protests that happened on January the 6th as people protested the outcome of the election, but more importantly, the refusal of Congress to investigate the allegations of voter fraud. We will talk about that today, but more importantly, I'm going to continue my discussion about false prophets and false hope and where that has and will lead us. I'm Randall Terry. This is Voice of Resistance. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked. Those who uphold the law resist them. Welcome to the Voice of Resistance. Welcome to the program, friend. In this first segment, I will take a quick look at what happened yesterday, some of the political talking points of all sides. But the main part of this program is going to be dealing with false prophets, false hope, the people who have done us ill by their insistence that a miracle was going to happen. If you watch Tuesday night's program before the Georgia election, before the votes were confirmed by the Congress regarding the outcome of the election, the election being certified, I spoke to you about false prophets and the danger that they are to this country. I will continue with that discussion after this break. But I would like for a moment to focus on the horror of yesterday. Listening to Mitch McConnell say that this was an insurrection, these people rushing the, the Capitol was offensive. Clearly what these people did by breaking through those windows and going into our Capitol illegally was wrong. It was absolutely wrong and it played right into the hands of the enemies of freedom and justice in this country. And they will be using this incident, believe me, I'll talk more about that later. But to call it an insurrection was an offense. These people weren't trying to take over the government. They were trying to get their government to be heard, trying to get their government to hear them. They were trying to say, look, we want you to investigate whether or not this election and the victory of Joe Biden was based on fraud. And the fact of the matter is, we don't know, we may never know unless Congress convenes some type of hearing, whether in the House or in the Senate. Marco Rubio would like to have hearings. He said that it would be in everyone's interest. Of course, the question people are asking is why for the last two months haven't there been any hearings? But I digress. As you know, and the show has covered, Throughout the summer, there were riots in multiple cities, buildings taken over, a courthouse, a police station, massive fires, government facilities being burned, statues being torn down. And the press said that this was an expression of the outrage of the systemic injustice and racism that was happening in America. And certain commentators, such as uh, Governor Cuomo's brother, Christopher Cuomo, were saying that where does it say that protests have to be peaceful? Well, the First Amendment talks about peaceful assembly. So it's in the First Amendment. I love the right in this country to protest. I have practiced protest for 35 years. I have practiced peaceful civil disobedience. No harm to individuals, no harm to property. That is also a rich part of the American experiment of self-government. Martin Luther King, women's voting rights, and many, others, many other examples were based upon peaceful protest, including peaceful civil disobedience. What we saw over the summer was not that. What we saw in the Capitol yesterday was not that. And now four people are dead. And as I mentioned a moment ago, <clears throat> the adversaries of the religious right, the conservative right, the Second Amendment, pro-life, pro-marriage, anti-socialism, 
anti-illegal immigration. That whole wing of the country is now going to come under a special sort of political oppression because a handful of people gave them the tool to do it. If this had been nothing but a peaceful protest yesterday, the outcome obviously would not have included four dead people and we would not have what we are about to endure. But what I want you to remember on these talking points is that it was not an insurrection. Look inside the rotunda where the people were. We had paintings hanging all over that rotunda, for example, that are priceless, worth unthinkable millions of dollars, a part of our heritage. None of them were damaged. They weren't there to loot. They weren't there to riot. They weren't there to destroy property. They weren't there to overthrow the government. They were there to demand that their voices be heard. And they did it in a way that is inappropriate, that was wrong, that doesn't help, that is going to backfire. And the images of people storming the Capitol are going to be with us for many years to come. And it's, it's going to, it's not going to be played side by side on most networks with the images of Chaz in Oregon taking over blocks for weeks at a time, calling themselves an independent nation. It's not gonna be played side by side as it should be. So keep in mind that there is going to be hypocrisy of the highest level, a double standard of the highest level, and that the political outcome of the Georgia runoffs and the certification of President-elect of President Biden and the, the, the violence, the breaking into the Capitol, all of that is going to be with us and the fruit of that is going to be with us for a long time. I'm gonna take a quick break. When we come back, I'm gonna focus on the main intent of this program. And this is for the Christian community, evangelical, Roman Catholic, whatever strain of Trinitarian Christianity you are from, you know what I'm talking about. The emails, the texts, the tweets of people telling us that Trump was gonna win no matter what. God showed me. These people have shown themselves to be false prophets, giving false hope. And I'll tell you what it means for us when we come back. Welcome back, friend. In the days of Jeremiah, he prophesied for four decades that the sins of Judah, most critically, the killing of their children in the valley of the son of Topheth, valley of the son of Hinman, child sacrifice, that the blood that they were shedding, the blood that Manasseh shed, would result in the judgment of God. Jeremiah prophesied repeatedly, Babylon would come, they would take Jerusalem, and then ultimately he said they will destroy the temple. And he said it because the people were involved in child sacrifice, in idolatry, in horrific sexual crimes. They were cheating one another. They had become, in all intents and purposes, a practicing pagan nation. Though they were called by the name of the Lord, though they were the chosen people, their practices, their deeds, had become like that of the pagan nations before them. Now, as I go forward in tonight's program, I'm going to make parallels with the United States. Sometimes you can make the parallel in your own mind. Think of America today. Think of America 50 years ago. If someone had stood up in 1959, the year that I was born, if someone had stood up and during my baptism said, I predict a day when homosexuals will be marching in the street demanding the right to be married and that right will be granted them. I predict a day when there will be an incessant flood of pornography on the internet. I predict a day when it will be illegal for children to pray the Lord's Prayer at the beginning of school. The Ten Commandments will be taken down off of the walls and hallways and classrooms in public schools across the country. But in those same buildings, they will give children condoms. 
They will give minors birth control without their parents' knowledge or without their parents' consent. I predict the day will come when children will be slaughtered by the millions. In those same schools, young girls, 15, 16 years old, will be sexually active. They will get pregnant and then the school staff will take them to an abortion clinic and kill their baby without their parents knowing about it. If that had happened in 1959, if someone had stood up in the year that I was born and made that proclamation in a church, that cleric, be he pastor or priest or a Sunday school teacher, whoever, a prophetic woman in their midst, that person would have been immediately dismissed from their position, fired. They would probably have been put under some type of psychiatric evaluation. They might have been charged in some states with a crime for saying the things that they said because that would have been tantamount either in those days they had laws against blasphemy, they had laws against saying certain things that were of a, of a purient nature, of a, of a perverse or criminal nature, depending on the state. They would not have been believed. They would not have been honored. They would have been dismissed as a raving lunatic. This is 60 years ago. What was unthinkable 60 years ago, and please hear me, unspeakable in a public setting. The very words that I just said to you would have been unspeakable in a public setting. The words that were unspeakable, the thoughts that for most people would have been unthinkable, are now common. It's exactly where we are. What is unthinkable today? What is unspeakable today that will be happening 20 or 30 years from now? Our trajectory is still going like this. President Trump gave us the reprieve. We squandered it. We lost it, and now the Democrat Party and its platform, its agenda, all right, they have an agenda, it's laid out in their party platform. They now control both houses of Congress and the presidency. Where do you think that this is going to take us? What is unthinkable today? What is unspeakable today that is going to be happening 10 or 20 or 30 years from now. I'm going to take a break and I'm going to read from you or read for you from the prophet Jeremiah when we return. Please don't go away. Welcome back to the program, friend. I'm reading to you from Jeremiah chapter 27. Jeremiah has been preaching to King Zedekiah. Babylon has already come and taken portion of the people, some of the very best of the artisans and the princes, and taken many of the articles of the house of the Lord. But Jerusalem is still standing, and the temple is still standing, and Zedekiah has vowed that he will be a vassal to Nebuchadnezzar, and he is about to break that vow. So during this time, false prophets are telling Zedekiah that the Lord, the God of Israel, is going to deliver Israel, deliver Judah. I beg your pardon. The northern ten tribes then had, had become known as Israel, and they had already been wiped out. So now Judah, Jerusalem, they are still extant. They're still there, alive, but the end is near. And the false prophets are telling the king and the people of the land, God's going to deliver us. So this is what Jeremiah says to him. Do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your interpreters of dreams, your mediums or your sorcerers who tell you you will not serve the king of Babylon. They prophesy lies to you that will only serve to remove you from your lands. I will banish you and you will perish. But if any nation will bow its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will let that nation remain in its own land to till it and to live there, declares the Lord. 
I gave the same message to Zedekiah, king of Judah. I said, bow your neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon. Serve him and his people and you will live. Why will you and your people die by the sword, famine, and plague with which the Lord has threatened any nation that will not serve the king of Babylon? Do not listen to the words of the prophets who tell you you will not serve the king of Babylon, for they are prophesying lies to you. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. They are prophesying lies in my name. Therefore, I will banish you, and you will perish, both you and the prophets who prophesy to you. Let me continue, please. Now, I'm, I'm making this connection to the Sidney Powells, to the Lynn Woods, to the innumerable pastors, priests, visionaries of the Roman Catholic and the evangelical world who have been telling people for weeks now that God was going to do a miracle and deliver Jerusalem from the hand of the king of Babylon. Oh, I'm sorry. What I meant to say was that God was going to deliver Washington, D.C. and the nation from Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. It was always a lie. It was always a false prophecy. It was false. Now, some of you, I'm, I mean, I'm sorry to say that because people that we love, people that we've trusted, people that we've respected have made these promises and these declarations, assuring us that they heard the word of the Lord, they heard the voice of the Lord, they saw a vision. They were deceived, and then they proceeded to deceive millions of Americans. And now we're ill-prepared. Now there are four people dead. Now, the bad guys in our narrative as a nation are going to trample, they are going to attempt to trample certain religious freedoms, freedoms of speech. They're probably going to come at some level after our Second Amendment rights. And this is in part because false prophets have prophesied lies to us. Let me go to, um, by the way, what Jeremiah did here with Zedekiah, I'll finish up with this, it's kind of funny. It would be funny, except it's not. He said, then I said to the priests and all the people, this is what the Lord says. Do not listen to the prophets who say, very soon now, the articles from the Lord's house will be bought, brought back from Babylon. They are prophesying lies to you. Do not listen to them. Serve the king of Babylon and you will live. Why should this city become a ruin? If they are prophets and have the word of the Lord, let them plead with the Lord Almighty that the articles remaining in the house of the Lord and in the palace of the king of Judah and in Jerusalem not be taken to Babylon. For this is what the Lord Almighty says about the pillars, the bronze sea, the movable stands, and the other articles that are left in the city, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, did not take away when he carried Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, along with the nobles of Judah and Jerusalem. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says about the things that are left in the house of the Lord and in the palace of the king of Judah and in Jerusalem. They will be taken, and there they will remain. They will be taken to Babylon, and there they will remain until the day I come for them, declares the Lord. Then I will bring them back and restore them to this place. So again, to give you the full picture, Nebuchadnezzar had come, taken the most precious articles of the temple of the Lord, taken nobles, artisans, the cream of the crop as captives and hostages to Babylon. And then you had false prophets coming around saying, all the articles are coming back. The people are going to come back. Hannah and I said, in two years, they're going to be coming back. Just like the false prophets of today. And Jeremiah said, go ahead, plead with God that they all come back. It's not going to happen. And furthermore, all the rest of the articles that you see here, they're going to be taken to Babylon too. And they're going to remain there until the day that I, God, call for them to bring them back. And so these false prophets inspired rebellion in the people to what God really wanted of them. False hope, false prophecies, 
and it led to the destruction of Jerusalem. I've got to take a quick break to finish up when I come back. Welcome back, friend. In Jeremiah chapter 28, we see the false prophet Hananiah prophesying, saying, in two years, I'm going to bring back all of the articles. I'm going to bring back Jehoiakim. I'm going to bring back all the exiles. You can see it for yourself. Jeremiah said, no, it's a false prophet. You have caused the nation to trust in lies. And then he proceeds to tell or to send a letter to the captives that are in Babylon. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Notice that God says, I carried them. Stop and think with me for a minute. When the Jews were marching through the arid wasteland, clutching onto life, being taken away as hostages, exiles to Babylon, they would not have thought God's carrying us there. This is the worst thing that had ever happened to them. Their wealth gone, their homeland behind them, their political and civil rights crushed. Yet God said, I carried them to Babylon. It was his chastisement. It was his judgment. So God said, I'm running out of time, so you look it up for yourself in chapter 29. He said, pray for the city that you live in. Seek its prosperity. Give your daughters in marriage. Have your sons get married. Build houses. You're going to be there for 70 years. Seek the prosperity of the city that you live in because if the city prospers, God said, you'll prosper. But God said, I sent them. And he rebuked the false prophets because they were saying, oh, the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon that say this is going to be over soon. Jeremiah said, no, they're false prophets, and he actually predicted the death of two of them, and they died. Bab the king of Babylon killed them because they were false prophets. God was punishing Judah, and there was nothing that could be done to evade or avoid the punishment that was upon them because of the blood that cried from the ground. Friend, judgment is beginning. It's upon us. Babylon is at the gate. Nebuchadnezzar, whatever imagery you want, judgment is upon us. We're not going to be able to stop it. We should lift up our voices for justice, for babies, for truth. But don't believe the lying prophets who say to you that this is going to be quick and easy because it's not. Think of the Jews who God said, I carried them as exiles to Babylon. Lord God, have mercy on us. Help us, Jesus. God bless you.